this is going to be more of a didactic lecture. And really what I thought I would do is level set for the audience where we stand with some basics as it relates to immunology and immunotherapy, which as we all know is really um, going to be sort of this burgeoning explosion of new therapies. So I've sort of entitled this lecture uh, Immunotherapy 101, A Guide for the Urologist. So these are my those are my disclosures, and so the, object, the objectives of this talk is going to be to explain and define the mechanism of action behind the immune response to cancer. Again, we're going to talk about really some basics about what the immune system does and better define the types of immunotherapy, current and emerging, used for cancer treatment. So these are my ARS questions. First question, Coley's toxin is one of the first examples of an autologous immunotherapy, true or false? So 71% said true, 21% false. Second question, following localized radiation therapy of a solid tumor with metastatic sites, there can be resolution shrinkage of these sites away from the primary. This phenomena is known as a, the Epscopal effect, B, the Crawford phenomena, C, Stouffer syndrome, or D, the Pringle maneuver. So 88%, uh, that's correct. So uh, last question, the following are all cells critical to the innate immune system except A, dendritic cells, B, macrophages, C, NK, or natural killer cells, or D, CAR T cells. Good. All right, so um, this slide, uh, and it really was is dated, it's 2012, but basically the, this is really related to prostate cancer uh, tumor cells, and so we know the canonical mechanism, as was described earlier, we know is all driven by the androgen receptor, which, which involves binding of the androgen ligand to the receptor, result, uh, then you get nuclear trans translocation of the receptor ligand complex, DNA binding, transcription, and translation. So when we look at the current therapies that are available, we know that historically speaking, as we all know, hormonal therapy has been sort of the foundation, and now with some of these secondary, secondary hormonal agents, including abiraterone, this is sort of the MD, uh, this was the original MDV3100, which we now know as enzalutamide. Then we have targeted therapies, cytotoxic therapies, which were your traditional chemotherapeutic agents. Then we also know because of the potential for prostate cancer to metastasize, we have bone targeted therapy, which involves not only treatment, but as well as uh, attempts, since we know that androgen deprivation therapy does result in bone mineral density loss, we also get some bone targeted agents that are available to not only uh, prevent SRE, but also increase bone mineral density. But s clearly what we know now, and again, this has really been over the past few years has exploded, is immunotherapy. And the one, uh, as this slide shows, that was initially approved was, was Sapula Cell T, which we know is an autologous immunotherapy. But since 2013, and again, this continues to almost change on a monthly or weekly basis, this is all about immunotherapy. So, you know, really thought, what I thought I would do is sort of level set for everybody sort of the basics of the immune response. So this is William Coley. So Coley was a surgeon in New York. He was a general surgeon. He actually had a very specialized niche. I don't know anybody that does this now, but he only really took care of sarcomas. And what he observed in the late 1800s is that there was a patient who had a metastatic sarcoma site to his neck that developed a severe skin infection and actually had spontaneous resolution of the tumor. And so Coley postulated that, hey, you know, possibly this was related to this inflammatory response. So what Coley did, and really this is kind of one of the true first clinical scientists, what he did, he, he basically injected tumor sites, most of them were inoperable sarcomas that were metastatic. He injected attenuated uh, a mixture of strep pyogenes and another bacteria which we, know, which we now know is serratia. He basically attenuated them, he heat killed them and directed and he injected these directly into the tumor sites to set up this basically immune response. And so actually, this was sort of, uh, sort of one of the first uses of immunotherapy, but it was a direct injection in hopes of creating this immune response 
that uh, he believed would result in resolution of these tumors. So many of you have probably seen variations of this timeline. So Coley did his first work in the late 1800s. Then there, there was sort of this, there was really a lack of anything. But then back in, in, in the 60s, we started using BCG. Rosenberg then started doing a lot of work at NIH uh, with, with interferon IL-2. But as you can see here, uh, as we all know, the first cellular immunotherapy approved for prostate cancer was Sapula Cell T in April of 2010. And since then, we have had a number of different immunotherapies approved. And again, this number continues to increase, and I predict will basically continue to go on for the next couple years. So when we talk about the immune system, you really have to talk about two basic concepts. You talk about an innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The, so the innate system is nonspecific. You don't need antigen presentation. It doesn't have memory. The time, the, the time frame, it's an immediate course of action. The duration is transient. And the cell types really are macrophages, macrophages dendritic cells, natural killer cells, and neutrophils. The adaptive system, which is really, uh, again, I think more important, it is and it, the, the, it's very specific. It does require antigen stimulation. It, is, it does generate memory. It's slowly developing. Um, and you have a lifelong duration. And its main cells really are T cells and B cells. So again, the cells of the innate system, you have the neutrophils, which are basically uh, result in phagocytosis and debris cleanup. It secretes cyto uh, cytokines that call in other innate immune cells. You have these dendritic cells, uh, which are very important to understand, especially uh, in, uh, with the current immunotherapy that's approved of Sapula cell T. And, and these are the antigen-presenting cells. You have macrophages, and you also have these natural killer cells. When you look at the adaptive immune system, this is really based upon two types. You have basically your, your B lymphocytes, which are responsible for, for specific antibody production that are generated against extracellular uh, epitopes or, or microbes with specific antigen. This is when, again, when we took immunology back in college and medical school, this was sort of that lock and key effect. So it results in specific antibody production. You get neutralization, lysis, and phagocytosis. The T, cell immune, uh, the T cell response really re involves these antigen presenting cells, uptake of an antigen, presentation, and then activation of, the, of, of these uh, really uh, uh, specific T cells that again uh, will have long-term memory. So the initiation of this is really, and this is courtesy of our folks from Dendrion, is that you have these antigen presenting cells, they take up the antigen, you get presentation of these antigen fragments. For Sapula cell T, it's actually against the, the antigen that, that is used to stimulate these acti this activation is prostatic acid phosphatase. This actually happens in lymphoid organs. Then you have these activated T cells. Then you, get, then, then you have the effector cells that basically result in cell death. These effective cells, again, are targeted. You get upregulation. And again, this is antigen specific. So when you look at this at the receptor level, and this is probably the most important slide because you hear these terms all the time. You hear about CTLA-4 PD-1 blockade. So again, what you have here, the key cell here is the T cell. So as we showed, this priming phase is really a two-step process. So what you have in these dendritic cells that have taken up the antigen, they present through a major histocompatibility uh, receptor, they basically have this presentation of this specific antigen which binds to the T cell receptor. Then you also have these other basic proteins Ignore this for a second, but you have these other basic proteins that when they also bind to certain receptors, you then get activation of these T cells that become very specific. So this is sort of the priming of these T cells. Then on the effector side, what tends to happen is that, again, you have an antigen that's been, that's been targeted. You get binding of the, of the activated receptor to the antigen on the cancer cell. But because of this binding over here to, to CD28 receptor, you get this whole upregulation. 
But what happens is that we have these natural, we have these natural proteins, these checkpoint inhibitors. And so what happens is that on the dendritic cell, these checkpoint, these checkpoint proteins, when it binds to CTLA-4, what that, what that results in is basically an inhibition of the T cells. On the effector side, you then have PD-1 and PD-L1. So if you get binding of PDL1 to, to PD1, then you get down regulation and it affects the it basically knocks out the effector phase. So this is this is really a very important concept, and it's important to understand where this actually takes place. So again, this rationale for immunotherapy combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors is that you have the checkpoint inhibitors, these anti-PD-1, PD-L1, CTLA-4 inhibitors, which really result if you block them, if you block this interaction, you then release the effect and you get upregulation of all these effector T cells. If you block PD-1 or PD-L1, you then block this interaction, which again is what normally results in a negative regulatory effect. So uh, again, this is sort of these, these critical links between the innate and adaptive immunity. This is probably one of the most, th this is a great little video uh, that I thought I would just show. And this really Hello talks and about this, this PD-1, PD-1 PD interaction. Today, we're going to be taking a closer look at how scientists use drug agents to help our immune system discover cancerous cells. Our bodies are made up of trillions of cells which work together to keep us healthy. One group of white blood cells, known as T cells, act as our own personal guides. They patrol our bodies relentlessly for signs of infection or other diseases and attack them aggressively. While on patrol, T cells use specialized protein receptors on their surface to latch on to cells and fully inspect them for signs that they may be cancerous. Once they've made a confirmation, T cells summon an attack on diseased cells. However, sometimes the T cells aren't able to recognize the bad cancer cells and they never attack. Scientists have found that many cancer cells carry proteins that act like masks and allow them to blend in with healthy cells. One protein in particular that cancer cells use for this deception is called PD-L1. When T cells use their PD-1 protein to latch onto cancer cells PD-L1 protein, they're fooled into thinking that cancerous cells are actually healthy ones. They then leave the cancer cells alone and allow them to go on multiplying in the body. Scientists realized that if they could find a way to block PDL1 on cancer cells, then the T cells could unleash an attack on them. This discovery led to the development of drugs made from natural human antibodies that block PD1, PDL1 protein interaction. The T cells are then able to recognize the cancer cells and begin their attack. Thank you for joining us on this brief look at the exciting field of immunotherapy. For more information, visit discovercarebelieve.org. And until next time, this has been Dana Faber's Science Illustrated. Yeah, so I thought that was like one of the greatest little videos that I've ever seen. So, uh, so again, you know, these cancer cells, to put it simply, when they express PDL1 that binds to this receptor, that's sort of their cloaking mechanism, if you know, if you will, at the effector side. So, binding of PDL1 or binding of the receptor basically takes that out and allows the T cell immunity to to sort of take place. So another area of immunotherapy is what we call radiation-driven immunotherapy. You know, we believe that basically ionizing radiation results in sort of these double-stranded DNA breaks that are more difficult for the body to repair. Probably, I mean, that sounds very simple, but there's probably a lot more going on here. So again, we get this ionizing radiation. We know that, again, we think it results in this, these sort of double-stranded DNA breaks that are, which are more difficult to repair than single-stranded breaks. But probably at the same time, you get this release of all these other molecules 
cytokines, receptors, adhesion molecules that result in this massive stimulation of the immune system. So again, the most dramatic clinical effect outcome of this when distant tumor masses regress is sort of known as the abscopal effect. And I think uh, Dr. Koo may be talking a little bit about this in terms of the use of radium-223, which is obviously a systemic alpha, uh, alpha emitting particle and, and how it could be used essentially with other combination therapies. So when we think about cancer immunotherapy, and again, this is sort of a generalized way that I think people ought to be looking at this, so we have vaccines, so we have checkpoint inhibitors. We do have, you know, there was some attempts at some oncolytic virus therapies using viral vectors. And then something new, which we'll touch base briefly, which is becoming more, important, more and more important, is adoptive T cell, uh, adoptive cell therapy. So we know that active cellular immunotherapy, though again, the one that's approved and the only one that's approved for prostate cancer is Sapula Cell T, which was approved in April of 2010. I'm sure many of you have had personal experience and know about Sapula cell T, but really what it involves, it involves an apheresis where you pull out these dendritic cells, these, these antigen-presenting cells, you incubate them with the fused molecule, fused molecule GMCSF, and basically you, you target prostatic acid phosphatase, you get upregulation, this process is, is, uh, takes place uh, ex vivo, it's shipped back to the, the provider's office, and then it's infused. And as all of you know, Sapula cell T is approved and it does have a survival benefit with, uh, with uh, recommendations by many of the guidelines that David talked about. Again, there, was an, uh, there were other attempts to use viruses at the vec yeah, viral vectors that have been attenuated. Uh, we know that native or engineered viruses that target, infest, and kill cancer cells. Uh, and unfortunately, the one, vir the one um, oncolytic viral uh, therapy uh, basically had a negative readout last year. We've talked a little bit about these checkpoint inhibitors, and again, I think what's important to know is that the CTLA-4s really target right here in terms of the priming effect, and then as we talked about in the video, the, the anti-PD-1s and PDL-1s really are at the effector side. Now, this new area, which again is getting a lot of press, and there's a lot of companies that are involved in CAR T cell therapy, there's Juno, there's Gilead, there's Kite, Novartis, is this concept of chimeric antigen receptors. And really what this is, is the incorporation of an immunoglobulin variable domain, which is fused to a T cell receptor. It emits the need of antigen expressing mechanism to be functional. So this is how you build a CAR T. It basically, you, base, you have a structurally, a single chain antibody that is attached to a T cell, a modified T cell receptor. It targets a native tumor antigen. You then have incorporation of some, some other uh, stimulatory molecules. This is sort of how it looks like. I'm trying to stay on time here, Dr. Crawford. And really how it works is that you get a phoresis, you get uh, upregulation of the patient's T cells, and then you create these chimeric antigen receptors, and then it gets reinfused. And we've had multiple generations, and again, looking at the, some various different types, but it all involves basically incorporation of an antibody that's fused to the T cell receptors. There are some immune-related adverse events with immunotherapy, and again, as we see more and more of these, because they are going to be, you, they're used right now, there's many of them involved, obviously, in the bladder cancer space, but you know, everything, um, all these immunotherapies are rapidly expanding with rapid approvals. So we get some dermatitis reactions, some ophthalmologic, some endocrine, and the list. And so again, as, as we choose, especially the medical oncologists are really adept at managing these, but as urologists, as we attempt to move more and more of these into our practices, we really, like anything else, need to be aware of the side, of prof side effect profiles with all of these therapies. So in conclusion, understanding of the immune system is critical as we develop new, newer therapies that target tumor cell antigens. Checkpoint inhibitors, especially in combination with other therapeutic, other therapeutic modalities, represent new opportunities. Ongoing clinical trials will still be needed, especially utilizing and developing predictive biomarkers. Thank you.